Uh, I'm going to graduate in 60 non-school days, or four school days, and I'm going to be shipped off to Alaska in 70. Well, I asked my employer what made me stand out to all the other applicants. And here's what I'm doing. On your application, you said you have taken classes in AutoCAD for two years. You have taken welding classes for one and a half years. And you have taken computer classes for three and a half years. But then you continue. And all of these classes were hands on. I respond with, yeah, they're hands on. He teaches us how to do everything that we need to do with those and how we can apply them. Um, we even get, you know, guest speakers that tell us what we can do with these skills. Uh, just the other day, we had the Air Force come into my welding class and they talk all about all of their uh, opportunities there to give us a job, to get some education. Um, for computer science, we went to Microsoft and we got to learn what we can do with our information that we learned there from Photoshop to even coding. Uh, in my AutoCAD classes, we've gone to Boeing and we've gone to Hexel, which is a corporation that makes a uh, honeycomb, which is like the inside structure of a helicopter uh, blade and the wings for planes. These are all very high paying jobs. Now, he sounded pretty surprised to me when, he, when I responded with, yeah, these are hands on. He said, most people don't know what a tool is or how to use one. To have a young man with practical experience is a relief. And from my grandfather's experience, he's told me that he had lots of ITs come in and people that graduated from the university with all the knowledge in that panel you know, book that they could learn. But no uh, practical experience. They had zero. They did not know that sometimes you don't need to go by the book. Uh, there's some situations that are not listed there, really. and they had a very hard time to go out off and just give up when they couldn't find a solution instead of thinking outside of the box. And that's what I like about CTE. They give a chance to think outside the box, try a lot of different careers. I know that there's agriculture, I know that there's cooking, I know that there's welding, automotive, wood shop, uh, computers, uh, child psychology. There's just a wide, broad range of things that we can actually apply with our life. That's what CTE means to me. Thank you. Stopping <laughs> this stuff. 
about the idea of the hearing board, but he also introduced me into FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America. And it's a fun club. We do a lot with CT as well. Learn about business, marketing, you can even do some public speaking. It's really fun to do an hour now. <laughs> and then my sophomore year rolled around and I got to take child psychology with Miss Seidel over there. It's a lot of fun. And she introduced me to SCCLA, which is Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. And we get to do a lot of that too. We volunteer. I get to help cook in Miss Carter's classroom, even though I don't take her class. I help with catering, and we also get a volunteer and help around the community. And then sophomore year, I also took economics with Ms. Jorgensen, and she also does FBLA. So through that, I've done FBLA and SCCLA all throughout my high school career. And then junior year, rolled around, and Mr. Eva rolls up from the middle school, and so I was able to take computer science one and two, Hardest classes I've ever taken, but they're so much fun. We got a code, and I even got to like go on field trips. Like recently, we went to um, this Microsoft thing. I don't know the name of it. It was an event, and we got to listen to some amazing speakers, and we got to meet some really cool people that um, work at Microsoft. Also work through like video games. We met the woman. Who didn't remember her name, but she um, did the game. Halo, Halo the game, you heard of that game. <laughs> I didn't think of that, I was like, ops. Um, but she's really cool and hopefully she'll get to speak with us. But CT has really like shaped my high school career, career and it helped me a lot when applying colleges. I got to ask for some pretty cool like letters to rec. And um, although I'm not pursuing a career in CT, it's really shaped me like through volunteer experiences and just making connections around my community. So yeah, CT means a lot to me. Um, 
working like in that class and working with like other people uh, within that semester, I really learned a lot on how to like get involved in things. So being able to like participate in CTE things. Now I uh, the one of the lead people, Teresa from Habitat, uh, she actually asked me once the house was starting to be fully on built, she asked me to come down and help her with some landscape ideas, which I learned most of my, well, some, not most, some of it from Ramsey, who will be here for our group that. Um, but yeah, I learned some stuff from like Ramsey, and then I do a lot of gardening and stuff at home with my mom, who's over there in the um, so just CTE stuff overall has really impacted like my high school career just because I'm being able to be involved with other things and learn new things while being able to be involved with the community. Um, 
<laughs> they have both been a very big part of my small journey here. Um, they care with their whole heart about every single kid that they have in their classes. They aren't your typical, you know, your typical teachers that, you know, you see in school that help you through. They help you through everything. They help you through all your classes. They're always pushing me and my how my grades up or have any help with anything, they help me 100% without a second thought. Sometimes they have a hard time saying no, but that's good. They have good, pure hearts. I love them both dearly. And their classes are so different from other classes here at Sidula High School. They're hands-on. They put you in real-world life situations. Um, recently, the floral team did a wetness night's wedding. Um, we did all the floral arrangements and we helped her at her wedding. It was a really cool experience, good um, money-wise experience. We um, helped with that. Um, and it's just different than any other class you can take. It's hands-on, you learn so much with it, and I have to Thank you.
an N here. Um, it's not a CTE thing, but to let you know it's happening here, we're doing something that nobody else is doing, which is uh, it's kind of helping out the drama department. Here are the sensors showing of a play, which is a donation, which is kind of cool if you've never been to one. It's a special um, kind of play that's pretty much there for people who deal with uh, sensory issues and need different kind of input so they can go see a play or an LA would be able to do it. So our high school kids are doing that as well. So it's pretty awesome of them. Um, thanks to those uh, individuals who came off again to keep forcing kids up here. I'm really boring and fussy, evidently, so <laughs> I'm not that exciting. I promise don't fall off the stage. Um, I promised Jerry at lunch today he went to Liberty Bistro. I think he didn't like his uh, pasta, so that was a good thing. So, so far, we're going to start. So, give you some information about Jerry. He's a Vietnam uh, era veteran. He served in the United States Army as a combat intelligence specialist. Um, after an honorable discharge, he joined the Magic Chef of Kinds as a factory representative in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine was one of the most successful representatives in the country for nine years. In 1991, he joined UTI, which is the organization you're still with, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. 29 years. There you go. <laughs> um, after nine years, he was one of the top commissions for TI um, representatives in the United States. In 1994, he was number one. An admissions representative and keynote speaker at UTI National Sales Meeting. He was promoted in 2001 to regional admissions director at Eastern uh, United States. Mm -hmm. Moved into the uh, director of National High School Development in 2008. And you told me to get lunch, but I don't remember the exact title of you now. National, National Director of High School Development. He sits around and talks to people that are really important with big titles. Thank you so much. It's pretty cool. Um, he was involved in a contributor in countless organizations, and this is what kind of piqued my interest when he asked to come here with Mr. Rick. Rick um, helped took us together with Garcia. Um, American School of Counselor Association, the Association of Career and Technology Education, National Science Teacher Association, Skills USA, FFA, Hot Riders of Tomorrow, National Automotive Dealer Association. He's a, a strong support of making education accessible, CTE, uh, in particular, we talked a long uh, time today. We went through some of our programs. Um, he's already trying to help us out. I gave him a hard time about ACT because you guys didn't know ACT ran an article on one high school doing Harley Davidson, one high school doing how that program, and we do both here. So I didn't know why they didn't call us because we do both. So um, I'm going to get on ACT about that. He's also the 2017 champion of the year for ACT. He's, um, there was a recipient of the 2015 Auto Dealerships Education Year Award, 2016 ACT Hero Award, um, and he was invited to present at uh, Lady Michelle Obama's Reach Higher Convening in 2016. Did I miss anything? No, you missed. That's, that's, I, can't I can't wait to meet this guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is he has a good name around here. We did talk about this Jerry thing going on in the um, because now there's three of us in the building, and all three of us said it's never happened. So, I apologize. That's all yours.
You'll find out how to troubleshoot problems of all kinds using engine analyzers, handheld scanners, and other computerized diagnostic equipment. After completing the UTI's diesel technology program, you'll be prepared to work on everything from big trucks and corporate fleets to farm equipment and more. You'll start with basic diesel engines and work hands-on through all major areas like transmissions, fuel systems, air brakes, chassis, flight control, and preventive maintenance. In the collision repair program, you can learn about welding, frame alignment, mechanical and electrical repair, custom paint and body applications, and factory paint. In the welding program, you can prepare for a career making sparks fly, cutting, shaping, fusing, and repairing everything from buildings and bridges to pipelines, power plants, vehicles, and even aircraft. You can even choose the NASCAR technology program in Mooresville, North Carolina, where you can learn things like engines, fabrication, welding, aerodynamics, and pit crew. In the CNC machining program, you'll get the skills you need to drill, mill, grind, route, and cut parts with laser precision for everything from high-performance engines and medical equipment to aircraft components and industrial applications. At Motorcycle Mechanics Institute, you can learn how to work on everything from street bikes and dirt bikes to racing bikes to the hottest parties on the road. At Marine Mechanics Institute, you can work on everything from stern drive, inboard gas and diesel engines to outboard two-stroke and four-stroke motors to prepare for a career on the water. The choice is yours. There will be 1.2 million auto and diesel technician job openings by 2026. Get there. Faster. Smart. Universal Technical Institute. We are for success. Your success. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, the only point that I wanted to make was to go back to 2013, where I had one of these phone calls that you think maybe is a prank call. I, I don't know about you, but when I get a call on my phone and it's not listed to a contact, I'm always thinking someone's trying to sell me a warranty on my car or, or you know, something else. But I got a call and I looked down and it said Washington, D.C. on it. And I said, well, worst case scenario, I'll just be able to hang up and block the call. But the call came through and I almost did hang up because it said the White House was calling. Uh, and that James Brown, the Undersecretary of Education, wanted to speak with me. And the, my life really changed a lot that day because what had happened is we'd been traveling around the country talking to audiences like you about STEM. And this was when the STEM initiative had just started. As a matter of fact, our, our first year workshops, we spent more time explaining the acronym than we did talking about what STEM was, because we were really early on board. We already gotten back to the Department of Education. President Obama, it was really more Michelle under the retired program, but President Obama was putting together a STEM advisory board to work with the Department of Education and help them advise them on matters of STEM. And they put together about 30 people, but not a single one that represented career and technical education. You know, that didn't, didn't seem to make much sense. Uh, my name had come up, they had gone out and, and toured one of the campuses without identifying themselves and, and really wanted somebody to, to sit on that board. So I went from, you know, just being out on the road and talking to all of a sudden being in the White House, getting an opportunity to shake hands with the president and have that picture of holding my fireplace, of course and actually getting to know Michelle Obama a little bit. I actually had lunch with her on, on two different occasions and actually did a workshop just for her. Uh, the audience was rather full of mostly security people and other people from the Department of Education. So as a result of that, a lot of different things have happened over the years. And when we had an election and a new administration moved in, I thought that I was done. I was very happy that I had the opportunity. But less than 60 days went by when I got another phone call. They said, hey, they want you back. So I have the opportunity now to go back and to work on some of the new initiatives. And one of the really fun things uh, and important things about being in Washington, D.C. Uh, about once a month and meeting with the Department of Education, I've had two personal meetings of the Secretary DeVos, uh, is the opportunity to understand what's new with the Department of Education. Because when they decide something in Washington, D.C., by the time it gets to Washington State, a year or more could pass before the word trickles down. So just about 60 days ago, the Department of Education came out with a new initiative, which they call PDE, Purpose Driven Education. So I sat in on the seminar, and, and it, it was an all-day uh, exposure to it, and became really excited about it. I saw how it tied into STEM, how it ties into CTE, and if we could get the whole country
country, school counselors, and even more important, perhaps parents, to understand what purpose-driven education is, I think we would have so much less debt when it comes to college and so much more uh, employment, good employment, in the career and technical education field, where we need plumbers, where we need welders, where we need electricians and diesel technicians, all the different areas that the wonderful young people who are up here talking about today, certainly uh, in agriculture. So I wanted to, to talk to you about purpose-driven education, give you some examples, and then show you a tool that we developed to help students be able to identify what their career personality is. Because you really need to know that first when you start to explore the different career opportunities. Mercedes-Benz or BMW or General Motors comes to us and say, hey, we've got a huge shortage of technicians in this geographical area of the country. And that's what determines whether or not UTI will open up a campus. We're very proud of our 91% placement rate, and we want to be sure that we have campuses in the geographical areas where when our students graduate, they're going to have lots of different opportunities. And you can see that on this map. One of the things that's kind of different is that we train for very specific manufacturers. And there's over 35 different manufacturers that students can train for. This is an interesting model, because how this works is the student takes their first academic year learning all the basics in their trade. But for their second academic year, they choose a specific major. And they spend the rest of their time in school studying just that specific area. So when they graduate, they have the necessary competency-based credentials to go to work for those companies. To give you an idea, we're talking about Harley Davidson. Six out of every 10 working Harley Davidson graduates today is a UTI and MI graduate. So you can see how these companies are dependent on the, on the 13 UTI campuses and graduating students and be able to hire them. Now what makes this kind of unique is a program called TRIP. Tuition Reimbursement Incentive Partnership. I'd like to tell you that we invented the trip, but we didn't. It was actually invented by hospitals in order to attract nurses. There was such a tremendous shortage of nurses that the, nurse, the hospitals would go to the nursing schools and they'd fill up a room like this and they'd say, look, come to work at our hospital and we'll pay back your student loans. Tuition Reimbursement Incentive Partnership. Well, what happened is the transportation industry, the welding industry, the CNC manufacturing industry, they had the exact same challenge. Nowhere near enough people to work in the industry. So we put together with all of these different manufacturers and more, a program where when a student graduates from school, their employer pays back their student loans on a month-to-month -month basis. So instead of asking, it's hard to go to an employer and say, look, I've got a great student, I need $25,000 to send him to school. Well, they don't know anything about that person. They're risking the money up front. They don't know who will come to work. It's much easier to go to an employer and say, look, I have a fully trained Ford technician. Has 80% of all of his credentials for record. 21 years old, great attendance record, drug-free, ready to go to work. It's going to cost you about $150, $175 a month to pay the student loan. Are you interested in talking to him? The answer is always yes. They need technicians that are happy to work with them pay back the program. So that's called TRIP. And we have over 5,000 different companies and dealerships and manufacturers and sports companies like NASCAR that are willing to hire or happy to hire the students because they have those competency-based credentials and they're able to go into employment uh, immediately. So TRIP is something when you think about your own post-secondary, whether it's agriculture related, welding related, whatever it might be, to talk to an employer and say, you know, when I graduate, I'm going to have student loans. But unless you're an all-star football player, it's very difficult to go to school completely for free. But to be able to talk to an employer and negotiate a tuition reimbursement partnership is something you want to consider. And we've done a really good job. We have just a whole department of people that do nothing but work with employers and set up these script programs. We're adding new ones on a weekly basis. 
of companies that are excited to pay back student loans because they're excited to get great students uh, into their programs. So purpose-driven education. So let's talk a, a, a little bit about that and, and what the Department of Education says purpose-driven education is. It's really not for um, uh, academic basis. It's mostly for concrete skills, like a welding skills or an agriculture program. So first you've got to kind of figure out where it falls into place. Each unit is taught separately. So students in, a, in, a, in this type of a program, this type of an education, they really take one course at a time. So unlike a high school program, they might take five different courses in, in a day. They're going to focus on one specific area of their training. And they're going to continue with that one competency until they can show that they have passed it and understand it. Then they move on to the next competency, and that's part of the first one. So what they learn in their first class, I always say you pack up that learning in your backpack, go to your second class, unpack it, and use that knowledge again. So that's how it works. So you're learning and using that learning and continue to advance through each one of the programs. The other part is advanced students. We don't want a student to take the course that they already know. So we have an opportunity, an articulation or a dual credit opportunity, where students can actually test and show that they have the competency and not have to take the course. So students can graduate from school on a much quicker basis when they're working with a purpose-driven uh, education. So they have the ability to show mastery. The next part is having the ability to go one step above. You know, when you talk about plumbers or electricians, we hear terms like uh, uh, internship all the way up through master technician. Students in, in a purpose-driven education have that same opportunity to become a master electrician, a master welder, a uh, master auto or diesel technician, a uh, master agricultural mechanic technician, and they have that opportunity to demonstrate that mastery and actually graduate at a higher level, and that usually results in, in higher pay. So that's what we mean when we talk about a purpose-driven education as far as the classroom is concerned. So part of the program uh, where they rolled this out, they had a video uh, by a wonderful man, his name is Dr. Kevin Fleming. And he's an interesting man. He holds several uh, master's degrees and PhD degrees, but he really is one of the biggest advocates for career and technical education. And instead of writing a lot of books, he has written a few books, but he prefers the Facebook platform. He likes to put videos on Facebook and videos on YouTube because he wants to reach a specific audience that might not pick up and read his book. So we put together a wonderful video, and this really explains why we're looking at a purpose-driven education as opposed to the liberal arts. Dr. Jim, hit that for us. There is a widespread belief that the job market is just waiting for forward and ambitious, eager young graduates to slide into high-paying jobs in the foreign office. They just need to go to college, right? Well, the data tells a different story. Charts like this imply a correlation between higher income and additional education, showing on average that a person with a university degree earns far more money than an average person without a high school diploma. This relies on averages and perceived higher earnings for having a four-year degree has fueled a college for all philosophy, causing educators and parents to encourage going to the university, any university, to major in anything in pursuit of social mobility and financial prosperity. This belief has increased college and university enrollment to an all-time high, resulting in 66% of high school graduates in this country enrolling in higher education right after high school. That's two out of three. But the problem isn't that we need more students to attend college, but the problem is too many students who enter not to compete. For most college students, it takes too long and they simply lose interest. Others are juggling too much, or they discover they picked the wrong major or attended the wrong institution for them. Since most students are told a university degree guarantees a higher salary, many delay their career planning until after college graduation, resulting in 62% of students reporting they feel disengaged because they don't see the connection between a course and a future career. And so today, only a quarter of those that initially enroll will finish a bachelor's degree. You see, our educational system is very well intentioned, but incredibly misaligned. The pendulum has swung too far towards college preparation at any cost and away from skill attainment. We even encourage a college going culture as early as elementary school, with university pens decorated second grade classrooms, and we spend an exorbitant amount of time in high 
high school getting into college. Education is core to our economy, but in order to guide our educational system and maximize future income, we must understand this misalignment between education and our workforce. At some point in recent history, we have transitioned from asking the more important question of what knowledge and skills do you need to be employable and to contribute to your community to now simply asking where are you going to college? When in reality, not every degree is direct preparation for employment. With rising education costs, a shrinking job market, and an oversaturation of some academic majors in the workforce, graduates take positions that do not require the education they have received and often with debt they cannot afford. In fact, this misalignment between degrees and job skills causes half of the university graduates to be underemployed in what are called gray collar jobs, and 33% of college graduates are still underemployed well into their thirties. We know that success in today's world depends on aligning the students' academics with both their skills and available job opportunities. Yet there is growing evidence of a skills gap in which many Americans are not receiving the essential skills that are needed. Recently, a survey was conducted to find out if the skills found in the local workforce match the skills that employers need in the new economy. We found that employers experience difficulty finding applicants with strong technical skills, as well as problem-solving skills, applied math skills, and basic technical training. Unlike three generations ago, having hands-on skills and perfecting what you're good at can be more valuable in today's economy than getting a degree into something simply to get one. In fact, when hiring, business leaders say a candidate's knowledge and applied skills in a specific field are more important factors than where the candidate went to school or the college major. The economy and the world have dramatically changed. In 1960, when taking into account all jobs in the American economy, 20% required a four-year degree or higher, 20% were technical jobs requiring skilled training, and 60% were classified as unskilled. But what's the right percentage to meet the labor market demand for tomorrow? Georgetown University predicts only 33% of all jobs will require a four-year degree or more in the future, while the overwhelming majority will be highly skilled jobs requiring professional and technical training at the credential or associate's degree level. The true ratio of jobs in our economy is one, two, seven. For every occupation that requires a master's degree or more, approximately two professional jobs require a university degree, and there are over half a dozen jobs requiring a one-year certificate or two-year degree, and each of these technicians are in very high-skilled areas that are in great demand. So while most jobs in the future will require some education and training beyond high school, the majority of occupations will not require a bachelor's degree or more. It was the same in 1960, the same in 2000, and will be the same in 2040. Very well intentioned, the recent College for All rhetoric is often misinterpreted as University for All. This message needs to be significantly broadened to a post-high school credential for all. Students at various educational levels have left school without essential skills, setting up our children for failure, costing them and taxpayers millions, all while the labor market is desperate for highly trained, skilled technicians. One of the essential purposes of education should be to help students develop the knowledge and skills needed to search for and obtain work that they find satisfying. Fortunately, today's students no longer need to decide between higher education or career preparation. It's possible and increasingly necessary to achieve both. So how do you position yourself for satisfying in-demand jobs? Let's say you're considering a career as either an electrician or a business manager. You would find that the average annual income for electricians is $53,000, only about half of the $99,000 average wage for management occupations. So at first glance, it looks as if getting a master's degree in business is a no-brainer. But adding skills and ability in the future has a whole new impact. What if you have the potential to become an excellent electrician but lack the skills and ability to be an excellent manager? Then you should be looking at projected incomes towards the bottom of the pay scale for managers and towards the top for electricians. You would then discover that electricians near the top of the pay scale make around 90000 far higher than the income of a manager near the bottom of the pay scale at 44000 now, this is just one example, but the concept is true throughout all industries. The claim that you will make more money with an increased amount of education is not necessarily inaccurate, it's just an opinion. That advice is based just on the average, but no one is perfectly average. Everyone has unique skills, talents, and gifts. Truth is, the income for the top individuals in a wide variety of technical jobs is far higher than the average income for occupations requiring a four-year degree. Nationally, Associate degree earns range between twenty-nine thousand and seventy-six thousand, while bachelor's recipients earn between thirty-seven thousand and one hundred two thousand. 
But if this data only accounts for the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile of full-time adult workers, this means 25% of associate degree holders earn more than 76,000 annually, while 25% of bachelor's degree holders earn less than 37,000. Our world has changed, and a university degree is no longer the guaranteed path to financial success as it was for previous generations. And even if you do earn money, that education alone may not be enough. In today's highly technical, knowledge-based economy, employers want to know what you can do, and what you can do well, not just what degree hangs on your wall. And new and emerging occupations in every industry now require a combination of academic knowledge and technical ability. One without the other is insufficient. We need to ensure we're providing students with all the essential skills required to be competitive upon graduation. So before enrolling in classes or deciding what you're going to do next in your life, step one is self-exploration. Take multiple assessments and really analyze your talents and strengths. Step two is career exploration. Understand the jobs available, the income ranges they pay, and evaluate both the knowledge and skills that are required. After researching all the possibilities, then engage in career plan by setting a flexible career goal based on your personality and abilities and not just your interests. This doesn't have to be what you want to do for the rest of your life. Just set a goal of what you want to do first. Only then can you develop a skills-based education plan, including your tentative career goal with multiple education and training options both inside and outside the classroom. This could include community college, military service, a university, volunteering, registering apprenticeship programs, industry certifications, or gain work experience. There are multiple paths to success. This is especially true if you are entrepreneurial. 77% of students want to be your own boss, and achieving the jobs while rebuilding America's middle class hinges on the success of small businesses and startups. The new secret to success is to create ample opportunities to explore and hone one's skills and to choose an initial career aligned with who you are. This alignment will help ensure one's position at the top of each pay scale. For the sake of our students, our families, and our country, we can't afford to get this wrong any longer. The time has come to redefine the goal for our students. Is the goal simply graduation or degree attainment? Or is the ultimate goal a relevant education to secure a well-paying career where they are both fulfilled and competitive in today's fierce job market? To ultimately secure a competitive advantage to the new economy, all students need a rigorous general education combined with applied technical skills, industry-recognized certifications, and specific preparation for employment. Will they be ready? Almost sounds like you described this school, doesn't it? All of the different steps and everything that goes into it. But what's so interesting here is to actually have people go out and say, coming all the way from the Department of Education, saying, hey, maybe it's not a good idea that everybody goes to college. Maybe it's an idea that we start to think about a purpose-driven education, not going to college and graduating and saying, wow, what do I want to be when I grow up now that I've got this degree? But to choose your post-secondary education with the goal in mind so that you have a purpose-driven education that's going to take you right into the career opportunity that you're most interested in. I wanted to talk a, a, about something that's interesting. In when did we wake up and decide that everybody had to go to college? You know, it wasn't always that way. When our, when our soldiers returned from World War II, the jobs that they were most interested in were skilled jobs. They wanted to get into the unions because unions were very big in those days coming out in the, in the uh, late 40s and early 50s. They wanted to get into the electrical union, the plumbing union, the pipe fitters union. It would go to where the jobs were. And you couldn't just walk in and then become an apprentice. If you didn't have a dad or a mom or an uncle or somebody that was in the union, good luck. You couldn't even be hired. So we were really focused on the skills. The people were proud of the fact that they were part of the skilled labor force. But something happened in 1971 in Griggs versus Duke Power. Duke Power is the power company and still is today in the South. If you lived in North Carolina, South Carolina, when you pay your electric bill, you're writing a check to Duke's Power. Well, what happened in 1971 is a gentleman in Griggs who applied for a position. And as part of that position, he had to take an aptitude test, which he failed. And in failing that aptitude test, he said, this isn't fair. Because demographically, where I grew up and went to school, I received a poorer education 
than other people. So the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, you know what, Mr. Riggs, you're right. You're right. You did not have an equal education. And as a result of that, they passed a law making employment based on aptitude tests illegal. So what happened now? If you own a small hardware store or a small grocery store and you wanted to hire somebody, you used to have a little aptitude test. You could buy them and some people made their own. The reason was that they make change. If I'm buying somebody to work behind my register and something costs $2.75 and you give them a 10, can they figure it out? Because the registers didn't do it for you back then. Could you go to the back and take inventory? Could you write up a report? Those aptitude tests, they relied on them. Now all of a sudden they said, oh no, can't use those aptitude tests anymore. But like, how can I make a hiring decision? So what happened is that the college degree replaced the aptitude test. So even if it was a minimum wage job sweeping the floors in the back of my grocery store, the ad in the newspaper, because remember, we didn't have the internet, the ad section, the wide ad section, especially on Sunday, could be many pages long, it would say, college required. So as parents looked through the one ads, as school counselors looked through the one ads and saw that all the jobs, even the low paying, part-time jobs, were saying college required because they couldn't give an aptitude test. So what did they say to their children? They said, Sally, Jimmy, you can't even sweep the floors without a college degree. Everybody has to have a college degree today. So many experts, and there's even a book written on the subject, say that was the deciding point. That's when everybody started to say, I want my children to go to college. And that's when school counselors started to say, my goal is to have everybody in the school accepted into a four-year college education. So to give you just a little bit of the history as to where experts say that all came from. So, I want to talk about something we call the old smart and the new smart. You know, there are things that we think at some point in time were very important and relevant, but later on, after years of investigation, we find out, you know what? Maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So when we talk about everybody going to college, maybe in today's economy, it's not such a good idea. I want to show you a TV commercial that really makes that point. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you would find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually mean just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine Doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camel than any other cigarette. Why not change to Camel for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how Camel can read with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. I don't want your throat. Dr. Smoking recommended it and standing up for different cigarette brands. So you can see what I mean by it. things that we thought at one time made sense over the amount of time we found that, hey, smoking is horrible. It's one of the worst things that you can do for your body, but yet at one time you thought it was right. It's the same analogy, and that's why we talk about purpose driven education. At one time, we thought everybody should go to college. Today, we're starting to realize that, hey, there were certainly some students who should go to college. Maybe they're going to be engineers and doctors and teachers, and that's wonderful. But it turns out that probably the majority of students that are going to college are probably not set for college. We, one of the statistics from, from Dr. Fleming's video that really shook me up a little bit was he's saying that only 25% of the students that start college are earning a degree within a six-year time period. I always heard the number was about 50 percent, but according to his studies, it's much lower. So only one out of four that are actually walking in as freshmen six years later, they're still not walking out with their degree. 
So we know there's got to be something going on there, that the wrong students are going, or they're going for the, for the wrong reasons themselves. So we have the old smart and the new smart. The old smart was go to school, get good grades, talk to your counselor, take the college courses, take all the tests. This is all important. The most important thing in your life is to be able to get into college. The new smart is saying, no, what we really need is a purpose-driven education. You need to go to elementary school, and now we have STEM clubs, even in elementary schools, and after school programs for STEM. When you go into middle school, career exploration, coming here, bringing middle school students here, and letting them go through the different CTE programs and getting an idea of what they're about. Bringing in guest speakers to talk to them about different career fields and exposing them. Then, in the post-secondary level, or the secondary level, when they get into high school, now we hear the terms career readiness and career pathways. So as they enter high school, the young man who spoke so eloquently as a freshman, you start to think about what are the courses that I need to take that are going to help me lead to a career. So we had the old plan, but now we're talking about having more of a purpose and a specific goal and career in mind as we start to go into our secondary. So when we look at at the high school program, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this. There we go. One of the things that he talked about uh, in Dr. Fleming's video is what we call the rule of 127. And I think that if every parent really understood this rule, they start to rethink their emphasis on college. 127 is a simple rule. What it basically means is in careers, and it's important that you understand the difference between a job and a career. One of the things I find when talking to high school students, especially if it's hard to get them engaged in a conversation, is to ask this question. Do you understand the difference between a job and a career? And what you're going to find is they do. They do. They say, well, you know what? I'm working at Wendy's 20 hours a week. It's a job. But it's not what I'm looking for as a career. So the rule of 127 doesn't talk about jobs. It talks about careers. And it's also real time. It's not something that's going to happen in 2023. It's happening right this very minute. For every 10 career opportunities in our country, only one requires an advanced degree, master's degree or PhD. Two absolutely require a bachelor's degree. But seven, 70% of the job market, career market today, requires a competency-based certification. Something that says, I can do this skill. I have demonstrated it, that I'm capable of doing it, and I've received a certification showing that I can start on the job today. You know, when you think about welding for just a second, you get two people that apply, and one person has a bachelor's degree, and one person has a competency-based certification as a welder. You know, when you look at hiring those two, you may like the person with the bachelor's degree and respect all the work that they've done, but if you're going to hire them, you're going to have to train them to be a welder. You're going to have to invest a lot of money in training and a lot of time. The person sitting next to them can weld now. You can accept their application, put them on a station, give them some blueprints, and they can start work. So that's where the job market is today. We're looking at careers that are very specific and require those competency-based certifications. And not enough people understand how 127 works and why it's, why it's so relevant in today's career market. So, one of the things that Dr. Fleming talked about in the video was that there were four steps. One was exploration. You know, take an assessment and find out what you're good at, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. Career exploration, you know, the opportunity to talk to different people, to go to career fairs and see all the different opportunities that are out there. Career planning, something that you do with your parents and you do with your counselor and especially your instructors to say, hey, here's my plan. You know, we use GPS to get from one place to another, but we don't have a necessarily a GPS map that's going to take us from high school into our career opportunity. And have a purpose-driven education. You know, we talk about the college scorecard, which I'll get into a little further, using the college scorecard to help you choose the right post-secondary school. Because we have a tool that really helps to make that decision. So, the Department of Education. So they've introduced this new initiative, and they're talking about it, and these are, these are their own words. A comprehensive guidance plan required as part of the Department of Education school code under Chapter 339 titled Guidance. So what they're saying to school counselors 
is that you need to spend an equal amount of time, the same amount of time that you're talking to students about going on and getting a bachelor's degree, you need to spend an equal amount of time talking to students about career opportunities that may not require a four-year degree, but would require a competency-based certification. So that's got a lot of school districts shaking their heads saying, well, wait a second. We're so proud, 98% of our kids went out to the four-year colleges. They don't want to know how many came home by Thanksgiving. They only want to know how many left the school with that, with that opportunity to go off to a four-year college. So they're saying, well, we're not equipped to, to, to be able to do that. So we put together a tool that can be used in the classroom in a 44-minute interactive workshop with the students to help them really develop their career personality and to be able to start to understand what the career market is like. And inside the folder that you've got today, I'm going to ask you to pull that booklet out. And just follow along with me page by page. And you can kind of see how this workshop works. And I'm glad we have some young people in the audience today, too, because uh, their reaction is important. So we've been doing, we did almost 10,000 high schools last year. We've updated the workshop a little bit, and the feedback has been absolutely amazing from educators and school counselors all over. So we start, as you can see, with the, with the guide itself. Like I said, 45 minutes. We have professional speakers that have to be trained and certified themselves. So we don't just send anybody to your school to do this workshop. They themselves are professional and have gone through a training program and been certified to be able to deliver. So we're talking about navigating your own life. You're in the driver's seat. You know, all these years when you got into the car, you got the back seat, you put your seatbelt on, and you know, you went where you were taken. But when you become a junior and a senior in high school, things start to change. All of a sudden you find yourself behind that steering wheel. You've got to navigate your own future. You're the driver now. Everybody else is in the back seat and you're leading the way. We want to be sure that the students understand that. The turning point is just ahead. We're getting ready to graduate. So you really got to start thinking about a purpose-driven education and what's right for you. So we have some fun with the students, and we do something called the tape measure life. And this is kind of cool. We get a couple of students up on the stage, and we have them pull out this tape measure in front of everybody, one on one side and one on the other, and we have them pull it out to age 79. Why did we pick that age? Average life expectancy. So we're showing the student on this tape measure, okay, they're 79 inches here of your life. And let's start to take a look at that. Then we say, at what point do most people retire? Well, they retire, average retirement age today is about 67. So when we take a look at from high school to retirement, it's over 40 years involved. But what we're trying to get them to understand is this part here, 18 to 24, those two to six years, what you decide to do with your life in those few inches actually determines what the rest of the tape measure is going to look like. So we want them to see the importance. If you don't make the right decision between age 18 and 24, it's going to affect the rest of your life. Make the right decisions, and you're off on a great career path. And it's a good way to get the students to really start to understand, wow, I've never really thought about that. I got to tell you, I've had grandchildren in high school, you know, 14, 12, 10 years old. I took the tape measure. I had it all pulled it out, and I went through the whole thing with them. They really seemed to understand uh, exactly what I was talking about. I wanted them to, to, to see that early on and be able to understand the importance of making those decisions. The workforce has changed. I mean, there's no question about it. Over the last hundred years, especially, we go back a hundred years, we were all working in agriculture. We were all on the farms. That's what people did. They grew. They sold, they transported, they fixed the equipment. It was all based on agriculture. Today, everything has changed. While agriculture only represents 2% of the workforce, we're producing more food than we did 100 years ago. So using technology, we've lowered the workforce in agriculture, but completed our raised production to higher levels. But today, the service industry, the education falls into the service industry, Career and technical education falls into the service industry, it represents 80% of the career market. The problem, the challenge that we have, and you saw that in the video as well, only 20% of the job market requires a bachelor's degree, 10% a master's or higher, and the great majority requires uh, 
competency-based certification. But this is a scary number. You know, if you're a parent and you have a couple of children and you're thinking about them both going to college, you have to realize that half, 48% of all college students that do finally graduate end up working a career that didn't require the certificate that they have. Didn't require what they majored in, didn't require a four-year degree, but spent all that money and all that time and they're working in a career that never even required all of that education to begin with. So the return on their investment is, is very poor. And they're frustrated and confused by that. So the new smart, we're going to show just again what, what, we, what we talked about just a minute ago, but now we want the high school students to understand that there's a new model. So we're going to take some time and go over the then and the now. We want to show them the fastest growing fields and talk about STEM and the opportunities that fall into STEM fields. And that 70% of the fastest growing career opportunities are STEM based. We want them to understand why they're getting STEM in high school and the importance of mixing it all together, the science, the technology, the engineering, and math, but even more importantly, the problem solving. Being able to use what you've learned in a problem solving environment. We go over the rule of 127 with the students. And it, it's interesting, they really seem to understand that. And at the end, when we have a question and answer period, we get a lot of questions concerning the 127. So we realize that it's really making sense for the high school students. Now, one of the most important things we're going to do is give them that assessment test. Dr. John Holland, who's world famous for assessment tests, died about six, seven years ago, a uh, Harvard uh, graduate himself, put together major assessment tests for all kinds of different career opportunities. But here's an, an assessment that a high school student can take really in about five minutes time. The instructions we give them is don't overthink it. Like the first question is, do you like puzzles? It's a yes or no. It's not like, oh, I really don't, but one time when I had the flu, dad bought me a puzzle book, and it was kind of, that's not what we're looking for. Yes or no, and they go through the assessment. And when they finish the assessment, they're going to come up with a score that's going to put them in a specific category. So once they've completed that, we take the categories and we show them the different career opportunities that they're fitted for based on their career personality. This causes a lot of discussion in the classroom. You know, one of the things we tell the presenters, let them talk a little bit. They have to be totally quiet. If they want to talk about what they qualify for and share their, their career personality with each other, we really encourage them to do so. So now they have a tool. Remember, in some high schools, you have a council that has 600 students reporting to them. There's no way in the world they get to know everybody's names, let alone their hopes and dreams. But a student can come in in their junior year for their senior interview and sit down with the council and say, hey, I've taken the assessment test. I know where my strengths are, I know where my weaknesses are, I understand my career personality, and I've selected some different career opportunities that I want to discuss in post-secondary schools that can get me there. So this works out to be a great tool. We also find that after we do this on Facebook, uh, later on that evening, there's a lot of posts from students who talk about, hey, this is what I did at school today, and it's kind of cool, and this is what I learned. So we realize that there's some excitement around it. And when we can get the students to excited and talking about career opportunities, it's never a bad thing. So you'll see on one page, we're going to talk a little bit about money, because not all high school students understand. You know, sometimes when you talk about how much money it is and you try to break it down into weekly or monthly, they don't completely understand. So we want to use an example of what it costs just to live. Just to pay rent, not cell phone bills or utilities or groceries or, or going out to dinner once in a while. Just the very basis. So we asked them to guess. What do you guess it would cost for a simple one-bedroom apartment in these cities? And they're never right, just so you know. And then they figure, well, oh, it's $800 a month or $600 a month. I can get a one-bedroom apartment. And then we show them the reality of what the national averages are. And when they see that, they're thinking, I'm going to be a one-bedroom apartment with 20 roommates. I mean, there's no way in the world I can afford to do that on a 10 11 12 dollar an hour job. I'm going to have to figure out a way to earn more money. So we have a little fun with them, and we, we make them like, what, what did you think it was going to be, and what did you think it was going to be, and we get that interaction between them. Of course, they see San Francisco, and they're thinking, they just can't believe that it can cost that much for a small one-bedroom apartment, but it does. That's the average in all these different cities. So we get them thinking a little bit about budgeting. And then we start to talk about what are the real choices? What can you do? 
you can go and get that college degree. But remember, the new statistic says only 25% are completing it within a six year period. But we have some students right here in this school, I met some of them today. They're going to be engineers, and they're going to be doctors, and they're going to be physicists, and they need to go to college to be able to achieve that. Lord knows we need ag instructors like crazy in our high schools. So if we can get students to go on and get their degree and move into agriculture, it would be a wonderful thing. So that's one choice, but you've got to look in the mirror and be sure it's for you. If 75% are not completing in six years, then it's certainly not for everybody. Then you look at the military option. Well, only 2% of high school students choose that option. God bless them. You know, thank you for serving our country, but it's a small number that you should go that way. On the job training, remember I talked about the, the welding? You've got the student with the college degree that wants to go to work, and you've got the student with the certification. If I'm going to hire the person with the college degree, I'm going to have to do something called OJT, on the job training. I'm going to have to teach that person, train that person. It's going to take months. You're not going to become a good welder in, in two or three months. It's going to take 10, 12 months. And, in a lifetime to actually perfect your ability. So on-the-job training, when it might have been popular years ago, today it's, it's very rare. You know, you only see it usually like the company of dad does it with his nephew or something like that where you actually see it being done today. But it's an option, it's possible. Community college is another option. You know, some students want to live at home. It's kind of like an advanced high school program. They get up in the morning, they're going to school, a lot of students don't get lost in that program. The graduation rate nationally is unfortunately a disgrace. It's a little higher in Washington, just so you know. Uh, Washington sets the bar a little bit higher, but the national graduation rate is 22%. You know, that's, not a, that's not a great number when you look at community colleges. And when we talk a little bit more about the college scorecard, I'll show you how you can find that information out for yourself. Of course, with a, a, a purpose-driven education, we're looking at trade school, technical colleges. We're specifically taking courses in the career field that you want to be in. It's going to lead you to a great career opportunity and maybe even an employer with tuition reimbursement programs to hire you when you graduate. But you know, these are the choices. Other than this, you can just stay at home and play video games. And you know, that's, that's not going to last too long before your parents are, are packing your bags for you, leaving you out the door. The college scorecard, which I talked about before, you may want to write down and maybe take a picture of that website. This happened during the Obama administration. President Obama felt that there was not a good resource through the Department of Education to help people choose a post-secondary school. They really had to rely on the admissions representative from that school who naturally was leading towards their own college. And there was a conflict of interest there. You go to buy a washing machine, you can go to Consumer Reports online and take a look at what the washing machines are rated and pick the one that's best for you, but you couldn't do that with a college or a trade school. So the president actually started, I believe it was one of his very first, actually had some history on it uh, on a couple of other slides, uh, but in the State of the Union address, President Obama said, hey, we're going to change that. I'm asking the Department of Education to put together a database on all Title IV schools. And for those of you who don't know, Title IV school means that they're eligible for government loans. And that, that makes up, well, unless you're going to, you know, Sarah's School of Bartending or something like that, most schools, post secondary schools, have uh, Title IV funding. And they said they're going to have to report quarterly and tell us about their graduation rate, tell us about their school, tell us about the safety, tell us about the demographics, tell us what the salary is, average salary for students that are graduating from the school. What is the placement rate? Uh, and what does it actually cost to go? Not just the tuition, because most students who go to school don't always pay the tuition. Between grants and scholarships and articulation and dual credit, they wanted to know the actual cost of the school. So when you visit the college scorecard, extremely user friendly, you can do it on your phone. It allows you to compare up to three different post secondary schools at a time. When you first pull it up, it gives you just a dashboard. Very quick information. This is what it costs, this is how many to graduate, this is the earning, give you some very quick facts. But then you can dig much deeper. You can learn about the town the school is in, what kind of safety issues are there on the campus, what are the demographics, what are all the different issues that you might want to know before you select this school. So the company has really grown. When they first came out with it, it was very simple, had very little information. But over the years, the Department of Education continues to refine it. Now it's a wonderful tool. 
We recommend it to students all the time. Why well, just look at the college? Why not find out about it? And if you could just go to one website and type in the school's name and learn all the important features, why would you do that? So now we're encouraging high school students, hey, a great activity in the classroom one day to start picking schools that you're thinking about going, putting them on the board and going to the college score. Remember, you can do free at the top and be able to really learn so you can make an intelligent decision. You know, if you were the best basketball player in the state of Washington and made the all-American team, and you got half a dozen colleges that say, hey, come on, come on, you know, we need somebody like you on our team, you would look at the, the, the post-secondary university or college that had the best record of taking students from the college team and putting them in the NBA. You have to do the same thing if you want to be a welder or a plumber or a diesel technician. You want to look at post-secondary schools and say, wow, this school has a place to bring over 90% in the career field. And that's when both of the schools that you want to kind of single out. If I'm going to invest my educational dollar, let me invest it in a post-secondary school that has a history of graduating students and putting them right in the field that they want to be in when they graduate. So that's what the college scorecard uh, will do for you. And we do workshops throughout the country just with school counselors, just on the college scorecard. Boy, they're always amazed. They find out that some of the schools that they've been recommending for years are great schools, and they find out that some of the schools that have been recommending are like, oh my goodness, I would allow my own children to go here based on this information. Things that just wasn't available to them until President Obama put that into play. Resume tips. So really important. The resume means a lot. Are you going to do a video resume? Are you going to do a little bit of both? Are you going to send a resume with a little video? interview, uh, how do you write it, what do you talk about, what are the ways to do it. So we take a few minutes during this 44 minute presentation and not teach them resumes, but give them the basic tips and understanding so that when they do put together their resume, they can put together something that they're proud of and employers can really take a look at it and say, wow, this is the type of person that I want to hire. Social media. When you look at some of these numbers, 67% so almost seven out of 10 colleges look at your Facebook page. Think about what's on your Facebook page. Would you be proud of that? Well, I'm sure some of you would. But there are others that say, oh my goodness, that's not, you know, that's not what I would want my college admissions, let alone my mom or dad, to be able to see. What's your, what's your email address? You know, is it, I love to treat beer at AOL.com? You know, what, what does it look like? What are people going to say when they're going to send you a, uh, an, an email talking about an interview. So we go over all the do's and don'ts. We think it's really important. Not only do 67% look at the Facebook page, but 40% don't like what they saw. So they're making decisions on hiring you and accepting you at the post-secondary school based on some of your own social media. It's public media. You know, when I get an opportunity to interview somebody, one of the first things I do before I interview them is I Google them. I Facebook them. If I'm going to sit down with somebody and have a conversation about a career, I don't want to know as much about them in, in advance. So I know what, what we're going to leave the conversation, what to talk about. It's a very common practice. So you want to think about that when you do your social media. So when we do that, when we talk in the classroom, you can hear some snickering and people say different things, especially what their email address might be or their, you know, their, their handle might be. And they start to understand that, hey, once you're a junior, you're senior in high school. You know, you've got to start to make things look professional because people are going to look at them. So we have a little bit of fun. We even show them some examples of some really, really bad things that people have said and done on Facebook that have prevented them from getting jobs. And of course, because we're transportation focused, we're going to talk a little bit about the career opportunities in computer numerical controls, in welding, marine technology, collision repair, the eight different STEM areas that we specialize in in our 54 years at UTI. We wanted to understand how many cars are on the road. There's 260 million. That's almost one per person. And of course, we have people that aren't old enough to drive it. But we have that many different cars that are out there. They all require repairs and service. If you own a car that was built in the last 10 years and it requires service, eight out of 10 times, 80% of the time, is software related. No one's taking out a wrench to do anything. They're reading the code and they're reprogramming the computers in the car and charging you or the warranty, charging the manufacturer, 
and you're on your way. So we want to be sure that they understand that many of these jobs that were considered grease monkey type jobs today are much more problem solving. This is a wonderful generation for problem solving, probably the best problem solving generation that we've seen in, in our country. We want to be sure they understand how sophisticated transportation can be today. You know that a, a, a Camaro, a new Mustang, more lines of code than a fiber jet. Because they have all the different things and sensors and everything that go into it. They're such sophisticated pieces of equipment that you really have to have the combination that Dr. Fleming was talking about. Hands-on skills and some smarts. That combination together allows you to problem solve. And that's what all of it is about, is to problem solve. We go over with them the different areas that, that we teach at UTI so that they get an opportunity to see what we have to offer. And then, of course, we told them about the college scorecard so they have other opportunities. Just like I did with you, where you explain to them about tuition reimbursement, this is important. You know, if you can find an employer especially going in, that's actually saying, hey, you graduate, come to work for me, you'll be debt free. You know, every month that you work here, I'll pay back your student loan. Now, if you leave me in six months, you've only got six payments made. But if you stay here for five years, you'll be debt free. And that's, that's cool. And, uh, and the opportunity to understand that, to know how that works. We want them to understand that different careers lead to different things. The, the uh, vice president of Mercedes-Benz in North America doesn't have a four-year degree. He graduated from UTI uh, and worked his way up into all of these different positions. So just because you start out at one level doesn't mean you won't go to another. We're going to encourage the students to put together their own list of questions for admissions reps. Tell me about your school. I saw this on the, on the college scorecard. Can you explain that to me? So that when they sit down and talk with their counselor, when they talk with an admission director from school, they've got a list of questions already written down that they're ready to talk about. We want to hear graduate success stories. Nothing motivates students more than seeing somebody. Somebody who stands up here and says, two years ago I sat right in that seat right there, fourth row, third seat. Today, this is what I'm doing. I just bought my new own home, you know, and, and uh, I'm making great money. I love my life. And that's what you want to hear able to share those stories. So we want to be able to share some of those stories with them and to take them even to links where they can hear YouTube videos of students saying, hey, you know, three years ago I was a high school senior and today, you know, I just bought my own home. You know, I'm driving a great pickup truck and, you know, I, I've got myself a nice sportster. You know, these are the things that I've been able to achieve by choosing the right education and the right career pathway. Bottom line, is it in demand? Is it career specific? Is it hands on? And can I do it in a shorter period of time? The average student earns, spends 5.3 years to earn their bachelor's degree. This is something I can do sooner because the sooner you graduate and enter the workforce, the more money you're going to make. You have to consider something called opportunity dollars. And we want them to see the demand in the industry because as admissions reps, we're not allowed to talk money. Believe it or not, there's actually a, a Title IV regulation that prohibits me from asking this, from answering a simple question like, how much money can I make as an auto technician? As a representative from a school that teaches that, I'm not allowed to answer that question. I have to refer them to a website or an expert. However, in this video, you're going to hear service managers talk about the amount of money that some of these technicians make. Ken, would you give us that? The manufacturers would consider this a crisis right now as far as the shortage of technician goes. It's a demand for people who have the skills and ability to be able to diagnose these highly complex vehicles. The amount of shortage of business we're expecting to see in the next three years. We don't have the manpower to get it done. Every day we're looking to bring on more technicians that are qualified. One of the biggest reasons we go to UTI is because of the quality of students we get from here. These students are ready to work. When they come out of here, they're trained in the same work environment that our shops are. We hired a lot of UTI students. We've hired close to 40 guys out of the GM program in the last three years. We're currently about 50% UTI grads in all of Northwest Canada. I've hired over 260 UTI graduates. I find them to be a lot more prepared for the industry, and especially if they take the manufacturing course before they leave. We especially love the manufacturing programs. If they have a desire for racing and engines, coupled with their education at UTI, uh, we know we've got a win. That's the individual we want to put in our company and help them grow and thrive and develop a career. UTI 
that is a good option. Not everybody wants an office job. I always have an interest for cars and they just want to take it to the next level. You're always telling me something you want to settle up with. Definitely the soil is worth it. I would do it again. UCI gives you a lot of resources to get a job. I feel pretty comfortable when you leave in the mind, you go to the dealership, it feels like you just walked out of school's dealership into an actual real life dealership. When you need job placement and you need help with that stuff, they're there to support it. I think if they were to look at the income potential right out of school, I think they would feel that it was a wise investment. You can definitely make money here. Technicians start around $15 an hour and go up from there. You can get in my main service shop, you're in the $30 range. Our average not to level technician is about $110,000 a year. When well, you can make six figures as a mechanic, we all benefit from that. We have a lot of benefits. We offer up to $22,000 of tuition reimbursement, as well as $2,000 in tool allowance. If we find somebody you'd like and they need a few thousand dollars to help move and relocate, uh, we're more than happy to do that. If we find the guy we like, we're not going to let a little bit of money get in the way of hiring. about six figures as a technician. Now, of course, I work for UTI, so we're, we're using transportation as an example. But those of you who are in other fields know that this is absolutely true. It's not just being an auto technician or a diesel technician. Plumbers and HVACR technicians and welders and health care and food care, the opportunities today are, are amazing. And when you listen to these employers say, yeah, we give them $22,000 in tuition reimbursement, we'll give them a few thousand dollars so they can buy the tools that they need. We'll do whatever it takes to get the right person in the right place. The opportunity right now for those of us who love hands-on and are problem solvers and believe in free or technical education, you're 16, 17, 18 years old today. The world is all open to you if you choose the right education to get the right competency-based certifications to make it work. So how does this all tie into STEM? And what exactly is STEM when we talk about STEM? STEM, of course, we all understand the acronym today, but do we understand exactly what the job market is like? When you look at this chart, you know, the, the, the job opportunity for a STEM where there's two jobs waiting for every STEM graduate, but the non-STEM graduate is interviewing for four different jobs. They're online. They're not nearly as in demand as the STEM graduate is itself. We look at the future and where it's growing and where it's going. STEM graduates, 26% higher income than non-STEM graduates. Skills USA says that a STEM graduate will earn $7.25 an hour more, more than someone who's a non-STEM graduate. So this is where CTE comes in. You know, when I first went on the, on the President's Advisory Panel, one of the things I learned really at my very first meeting was that 51% of all career opportunities in STEM were in skilled trades. So the majority, I, you know, I always say I'll give you the 1%, half of the career opportunities in STEM are skilled trades. But in, in 2013, when I went on the STEM Ed Coalition, only 13% of the government money went to career and technical education. My very first meeting, I stood up and said, how does this make any sense at all? If you're all agreeing that 51% of the careers are skill-based, then why aren't they getting 51% of the money? And that's why I said I'd give them the 1% and settle for 50% of the money. So in meeting after meeting, you know, when it was my turn to speak, I could look around the room and see some of these CEOs from big companies and, and college presidents from Purdue and Rutgers. I see their eyes roll. And I knew it wasn't necessarily personal. I knew that they could listen to me talk about CTE again, get out of my soapbox. And now, as we move into 2019 and 2020, we're up to almost 40% of the government STEM money going to career and technical education. So we feel like sitting on this advisory board has made a difference. And you can see with these different statistics, STEM is CTE. The Department of Education says this, if you've never heard the full definition of STEM, because academics cry to clean STEM. They don't like physics class as a STEM class. My advanced algebra class, uh, my advanced chemistry class. No, it's not. You're one of the letters. You know, you're the S or the T or the E and the M, but you're not all of them. The Department of Education says in order to be a STEM class, a real official STEM class, you have to use all four metrics, 
science, technology, engineering, and math, not 25% each, but you have to incorporate all four of them in a problem-solving environment. It's a simple definition. All four metrics used in a problem-solving environment. Think about a typical high school. Where would you find them? You're going to find some STEM in the math program. You're going to find some science in the science program. But where do you have to go to see it all being used every day in a problem-solving environment? It's your class. It's career and technical education. That's where you're going to see every one of those metrics used in problem solving. It's as simple as making a pizza in culinary arts. Do you follow a recipe that requires some math? Sure, a cup of this, a teaspoon of that, whatever it may be. Okay? How does bread rise? It's a chemical reaction. To heat, the yeast rises. So you've got your science taking place right in the oven. How do we cook it? We don't lay the ingredients out in the sun and wait for it to cook. We cook it with technology. We use a thermostat. The popular mechanic says it's one of the number one inventions in the last hundred years. The thermostat. So as simple as making a pizza and eating it to solve your problem of being hungry is the STEM exam. But think about when we get into some of the sophisticated classes that are offered at your high school. When we get into landscaping, and start dealing with chemicals and chemical reaction and designs and angles uh, and, and green technology. When we get into cosmetology, I'm, I'm going to show you some slides. I, I can go on and on because I'm such a believer that STEM is career technical education. They're the same definition all the way through. So we'll take a look at a couple of different examples. Internal field trips. You know, when I was walking around today, I couldn't help thinking about IFTs. Uh, this was another Department of Education initiative going back about six years. They called it an IFT, internal field trip. No, no box lunch, no bus, no permission slip. But actually taking an academic class into a career and technical class and showing the actual application of what they're learning. So students were taking an advanced geometry class and trying to understand three-dimensional geometry. They would go down to the automotive class and see a front end line. And they say, oh, that's three-dimensional geometry. So when, they, when you go over a, a, a bump, and you go through a, a pothole, and your car needs to be aligned, and you bring it over to the dealership, and they say, we fixed it. It was off by three degrees. You have no idea what they mean. But you just know it's fixed, and you're going to pay your bill to leave. But that's all part of geometry. When they're learning algebra, be able to bring them down to the electronics class and show them Ohm's law. They're like, man, I sit in a classroom 45 minutes a day, five days a week, just being lectured to. We call it Ford Store. Now I'm actually going into a CTE class, and I'm actually understanding, oh, this is why I'm learning that. Have you heard that from a student or from one of your own kids? I don't understand why I'm not learning. I don't understand how it applies to real life technology. An internal field trip does that. So I'm walking around this high school today, all the way up in, in Washington State. It's an old building, part of it's 100 years old. And I'm walking through the hallways with Jerry, and every, without any conversation in advance, he's showing me exactly how they do that in each one of their programs. Each program exists with the help of another program. So whether it's building a platform in the woodshop, or designing something in the CAD class, they're all working together. I gotta tell you, that's unique. I'd love to tell you that every high school in the country was doing that, but of course they're not. You have, I went to a school where the career and technical education and the academic instructors would sit with each other. The principal said, on the left side, those are the academic teachers, on the right side, career and technical, they don't even talk to each other. And how can that be? You know, we have to stop that. And we call it an IFT, and we went around the country, and we talked to people, and we encouraged high schools to do it. I was invited as a speaker five days a week into different high schools across the country to talk about internal field trips. And I come here, and it's an everyday accepted practice. That's a wonderful thing. I, I hope that where you go to school that you can institute this or make it greater, but to combine it so that the academic students really see what's happening. The other thing about an internal field trip, which is unique, the way that it's supposed to work, is when the, let, let's use the geometry in the front end line example. When they come down to the auto shop with a class on front end alignment is not taught by the teacher. The instructor has selected three or four students and taught them the curriculum. So the students come down from this advanced geometry class. 
down to the auto shop, which they didn't even know was in the school or, or never been there in their lives. And all of a sudden, they're learning the real life application of what they're learning in their advanced geometry class, and you're being taught by tech students. So it really creates an interesting environment. Uh, really makes the technical students feel good about themselves and changes the perception that other students in the school and instructors may have about them. So let's take a quick look. I'm going to go through these slides quickly. But this is some of the different STEM and how internal field trips would work. You look at all of the different opportunities and where STEM is going. Just starting your car. You know, I talk to students who love computers, and they don't really necessarily think about different occupations. You know, they're all going to work for Google, or they're all going up north to work for Microsoft. You know, one app, one application, one job opening uh, at, at the Google gets about one million resumes. So, you know, the chance, I, I, I don't want to be a dream killer, but you probably need to have a plan B. And the plan B, you need to really understand just starting the car, look at how many things happen on the computer screen in just those very basics. And get computer students to understand that most service requires a computer. 80% of the repairs are going to require software. Here's algebra and Ohm's law in small engines. We're using STEM all the time, the principles of the combustion engine, the four cycle, even when we're talking about two cycle engines. What about STEM and culinary? You know, why does that beef taste so good when we slow cook it in the crock pot all day? <laughs> it's not just because of slow cooking, it's the way the chemicals break down and, and make it tender, all of these different things that, that we may not realize. And cosmetology, just the color hair, and the different great technology that's involved in cosmetology because you're dealing with chemicals. What about physics and the PSIs? Wow. You know, when we talk about that, and when we talk about physics, and we get into high performance and we're boosting power. We're boosting turbochargers and so on. It's all physics. It's all based on BSI. So if you're STEM being taught all the way into our ag classes, you know, that's a, a big, big part of STEM. You're not growing anything without STEM. You have to have the science, the technology, the engineering, and the math to understand all the way through. DNA technology in our science classes, uh, electrical engineering. Then, you know, people are scared of schematics the first time they see them. But when they start to understand them, and, and can relate to the different math carpentry classes. Wow. You know, I don't want to live in a house that somebody didn't understand math bills. I don't want to drive over a bridge that somebody didn't understand technology and engineering built that bridge. <coughs> Graphic design, another example. CRRT, collision repair account, so sophisticated. Well, at one point it was a fairly simple thing. You banged out the fender, you painted the car. Today, just matching the paint is an art. Being able to photograph it put it through the computer and get the exact same color. You know, cars are expensive. Years ago, you could total a car for certain things, but you own a $100,000 Porsche, and you get T-boned, and it's a $30,000 repair, they're going to fix the car. They're not going to total that, unless the frame is bent. And even then, sometimes, they straighten the frame. So collision repair has gotten much more sophisticated. You get a dent in the rear end, you think you're going to replace your bumper. What about the sensor that told you something was not in your blind sight? What about the sensor for your backup camera? It's no longer just a bumper. So it's gotten much more sophisticated. Agriculture technology, just about every aspect. Math on the farm, how do we figure the value of our cows and, uh, and, and our poultry? All requires math and, and science. All of the animal sciences do. Welding, especially. And don't weld for me if you don't understand the technology. There's all different types of welding. Metals react to different metals. We have plasma cutters that don't even get hot. I mean, there's some kinds of new technology that are involved in welding. I want to talk for just a second. Let me go back here for one second. I want to talk for just one second about the scientific method. When you go off to an engineering school or a four-year college, one of the things that they're going to teach you right away when it comes to problem solving is the scientific method itself. Observation, understanding what you're looking at. Research the challenge that you have. Construct a theory, a hypothesis. What do you think might be wrong, and what will you need to fix it? Test that. Analyze the data. Was it correct or, or wasn't it? When we talk about what a technician does, we break it down. It's really the same thing. The observation is the customers. They're there to tell you, this is what's happening. You know, when I drive the car or when I start up the tractor. Research the problem. Have there been any service bulletins? Have I seen this before? 
Let me talk to John. Uh, he's worked here for 30 years. He might have seen this problem before. So you do your research. What do you think is going to take to fix it? Try it with the new part in, reprogram it, analyze the data, and send the customer on their way. So what technicians do in all different areas follows that same scientific formula that you would work on while you were in school, all the way down the line, right through installing the new part and sending your satisfied customer at home. If I can keep you too much longer, you, you've been wonderful. I want to show you a video that I think you'll enjoy. It's only about four minutes long. But how about STEM in NASCAR in motorsports? Hey, take a look at this video that NASCAR has put together specifically for high school students. Just goes to show, by the way, you went over a million dollars. That's why he was screaming. 
<laughs> at the end. So the results were, the results were, were excellent. Case studies, well, how does CTE affect you? I'll go through this kind of quickly, but, but really what all of these sites show us and prove to us is that in case study after case study, students who take CTE in high school do better on the national exams, better in their careers, and earn more money in their life. The Department of Education, the Department of Labor Statistics shows that a student that has a competency-based certification will earn 10% more money in their lifetime than a student who has a bachelor's degree. So another myth, you know, we think that, oh, he's going to technical college, oh, we're so disappointed. You know, we're hoping, they earn 10% more in their lifetime, even if they earn the same. Remember, a college student versus a technical college student, for every dollar you spend on your four-year degree, a technical student will spend 25 cents on their education. They'll pay 75% less for their education. They'll finish in half the time. Actually, to earn a competency-based certification, the Department of Education says you need 1.4 years. To earn a bachelor's degree, the Department of Education says you need 5.3 years. So there's a big difference. Less time, more money. Certainly something to, to look into. Which is right? I mean, that's what we have to decide. The answer is they're both right if you understand the student. That's why that workshop is so important, where the students take the assessment test and get to understand their own career personality. Studies show, we take a look, participated in CTE when students were asked. And participation in CTE, did it affect your grade positively? And the largest percentage of students say, yeah, they did. And we talked about CTSOs like, like the FFA and Skills USA and Hot Rodders and, and those different clubs. Percentage of students saying yes, you know, they believe it. Especially if you notice if they belong to uh, an FFA or Skills USA or one of these wonderful uh, organizations, future student organizations, you can see that they get even a stronger feeling towards their effect that their technical education has. What this is a really interesting. What what motivates you more than anything else as a student to go into a CTE career? The answer surprised me to me is guest speakers. Invite to all these other things, internships, sponsorships, all these things that we think work. When we actually questioned the high school students themselves, they said, yeah, those things are cool, but you know what I really liked? I liked when that pilot came in, and she talked about a career uh, in aviation. And I really liked when that landscaper came in and talked. That's what they like. They want to hear the stories from other people. So continue to bring people into your classroom when you have the time. Make it a part of your curriculum because students really like it. What a teacher said, 78% of teachers say, yeah, it made a difference. I feel that what I do every day, 8 out of 10, is surprised me the numbers not 10 out of 10. 8 out of 10 are saying, yeah, it makes a difference. My students are benefiting from what I'm doing every day. They feel the most important thing for them to do is to graduate from high school. Absolutely. That is the most important. But next to that, industry certification is what's going to find them a career opportunity. And again, here we kind of was telling you briefly how the college scorecard comes in, uh, and why it was made, how it started, and how it advanced to where it is today. I encourage you to use it and to visit the website. I pulled up some information to show you just where UTI fits in. Again, because I, obviously I work for UTI and I'm more familiar with it, but you can substitute UTI for any really good technical school that you've had experience with. You're going to find when you go to the college scorecard, there are some great technical schools out there, along with UTI, that teach other disciplines. But when you take a look at it, look at the two-year college income. So our community colleges are graduating students at less than $30,000 income, liberal arts 42, doctoral degrees 48, but look where technical school is. Again, about 10% higher than the liberal arts education. As a matter of fact, if UTI was a liberal arts school, of course we're not, we're trade school, privately trade school, but if we were, our earnings would fit into the top 10 of all liberal arts colleges in the country. And we're, you know, most of our students are in and out of school in 14 months, you know, spending 75% less on their education. This chart shows you that even if the school is more expensive initially, the time to recover that money is very short. It takes you about a year to recover the difference in a $10,000 tuition. The idea here is don't always let the price scare you away, especially if there's programs like tuition reimbursement programs. 
that will actually pay for it. And what we're talking about here is remember, those extra years in school are years where you're not earning any money. So UTI wants to help. We're, we're here tonight, but we want you to understand that we can do that workshop in your high school, in your classes, and really give your students this workbook to keep and have them have something in their hand that really helps them think about a purpose-driven education. We'll talk to your students about the 127 and the uh, different areas of STEM that they can go into. We'll encourage them to share the results with their counselors and their parents. We'll talk about scholarships, uti.edu slash scholarships, just hundreds and hundreds of scholarship opportunities that are available there. And with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. And thank you for being such a, a wonderful audience sitting here for 90 minutes. I guess I formed the story a little bit. Anybody have any questions for me? I know sometimes you go think of them tomorrow. But anything that you, you understand the 127, what a great tool the college scorecard is. You've got a great tool that you can use in your school at no cost to have an expert come in and go through this with your students and leave them right there in the classroom to help them with the personality. And the doctor spoke in town. You know, at one time we thought college was right for everybody. And I guess first on that bridge of versus new power in 1971, I can see why people felt that everybody needed to go to college. But there's a new smart today. It's quicker, it's faster, uh, and it's something that students need to consider. So thank you so much for your time this evening. Jerry has flown out here from uh, Connecticut, right? New Hampshire, New Hampshire, all the way, and uh, he speaks, you know, nationally, as, as he told you. So I really want to thank him for his flight and hotel and everything for, for him to, to talk to you uh, as well. Um, I'm the local guy. We don't have a campus here in Washington. So my job is to give part of what, he, what you saw, that high school pre presentation. So if you can pass that on to teachers who may be looking for guest speakers or anything, that's what I would do, is give them that opportunity to take a look at which path is best for you. And uh, always there's a couple kids out there that might want to talk to me further, but that's what I do here locally. And finally, I invited two from industry. Uh, Randy, would you mind just, oh, Randy, just uh, stepping around here. I won't, I won't take up too much time, but he's the uh, uh, service manager of Ford, and maybe you can, uh, Ford, Mazda, and Subaru uh, here in Skagit. And if you want to elaborate just a little bit on what you heard, and do you need technicians? Oh yeah, the industry is some of everything he said showed us exactly spot on. Um, uh, the, just the quick things that I know is that uh, it is a very good profession. Everything that you said up there about possibilities and reward is all there. Um, I hire um, graduates from UTI. Um, I see them go in a lot of different areas and a lot of different directions, and they all come out, you know, like you said, they come out ready to go. So I, I'm a supporter, and uh, you know, Mr. Garcia is uh, you know doing something really special here. And uh, when I went to school in Skagit County, uh, another local school, uh, everybody had a program, and there was a lot of pride in that. And you know, pulling in your own stuff and working on it, and, and the neighbor stuff, it was it was great. And we lose that with not having those programs anymore. And what. Uh, Mr. Garcia's got going here. I'm, I'm a fan of 100%. It's not just me. There's there's people out there that really desperately need these programs. And so I would be the only one in the only one. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing in Bellingham. Yeah. There's nothing, you know, one up a little bit in Oak Harbor. You gotta go very far south to get another high school. And so um, you know, that's really what drives me to be here on meetings like this is you know, so that I can try to help him and the program here do what they can do because the more, I believe there's more success for all the school kids in this kind of pathway than in the, in the thinking of everybody's gotta go to university. And uh, I, have, I have two sons that, you know, are, are, are pretty, that went through this school and they're, and they're pretty, they're doing good in life. They didn't go to a university. Um, one of them went through a training program with, with Boeing and has, I'm very good at that job, and, and Tanner's coming along, but you know, they're, they're not college kids, and I wouldn't have wanted us or them to indebt themselves that way when it's clear they just weren't made for that. And so this gives those kids those skills 